Anne is a natural dyer and textile artist based in DC. Her focus is in color experimentation, surface design, and education. Most recently, Anne participated in the Natural Dye Initiative at MICA in Baltimore, where she has met a wonderful group of textile artists who have helped shape the way she approaches natural dyeing as a practice. She is part of a textile collective from DC called To Dye For Collective. Over to you, Anne. Hi everyone, my name is Anne. Uh, I'm so happy to join you today and talk about um, some simple techniques uh, in the dye studio today. Um, before we jump into it, just I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about myself um, in case uh, you wanted to know how I came to fall in love with this practice. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of a background. Um, I started about uh, maybe almost a decade ago, probably between eight or nine years ago, um, working with synthetic dyes, but quickly fell in love with natural dyes once I uh, discovered this farm in Virginia by way of a friend um, called Woolham Gardens. Uh, I was able to sort of explore the, the farm, um, access all of the flowers and forage and really learn to fall in love with natural dye stuff and natural dye materials just in my surroundings. Um, that uh, has led me to uh, my love of teaching people about this practice. And so that's how we are here today. I'm so excited to kind of get back and hopefully someday do in, in person classes again. Um, but for the time being, I love that I can share this art form with you virtually. Some of the work that I've been doing recently um, includes collaborating with uh, some local artists, ceramicists, printmakers, um, and also floral artists. So this is just a, a quick look at some of the projects that I have been working on, including textiles for um, tables, um, garments, and also just some more installation-based uh, textile work. And that's just a quick, uh, a uh, quick overview of what I'm up to these days, and I guess we can jump into it. So today's focus is on simple techniques in the dye studio. Uh, what I'd really like to do is sort of go a little bit in depth into how um, you can prep your materials for dyeing and also um, talk about different ways that we can create pattern uh, with natural dyes. So just to give you an idea of what we're talking about today, um, trying to create a lot of different types. So I just wanted to show you some samples of um, different surface design techniques that we can cover today. I really, really love, along with the full spectrum of color that natural dyes provides, um, really bringing in different uh, design techniques to create uh, patterns and textures on fabric. My background is in graphic design, so I really love the marriage between my gra graphic design background and natural dyeing. Um, and so I'm excited to kind of share with you some of the experiments that I've done in my personal practice. Here's another example. And so I think that there's going to be a lot of really cool things that we can talk about today and hopefully get you excited about creating different uh, patterns on textiles. To give you a brief overview of the process, um, I'm going to show you just sort of a step-by-step, -step, um, high-level view of what goes into natural dyeing. Um, if you are interested in sort of learning more uh, of these different parts of the process, uh, we also did a class a few months ago, and you can go and check out that first video to kind of um, get a fuller picture of the process. But today, we're going to kind of hone in on certain areas of it, uh, including the prep and then also the surface design. So an overview, overview of the process you can see is one, knowing your fabric. It's really important with natural dye to distinguish between um, protein fibers and cellulose fibers. Um, natural dyes obviously uh, work a little bit better, most a lot better with natural fibers. So we want to really focus on, again, the protein fibers and cellulose. Um, what protein fibers are animal-based animal fibers. So that would be your wools, your silks, Cellulose fibers are things that come from plants, so cotton, bamboo, linen, et cetera. Uh, step two would be scouring. 
uh, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into scouring as well as the next step, which is mordanting. Um, and then step four, collecting your dye stuff. Step five, color extraction, and then dyeing and pattern making. So going into the next step, scouring. Um, this is a really, 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 really important. I cannot emphasize that enough. Really important part of the natural dye process. Early on in my, um, when I first started learning about natural dyes and started working with textiles and dyes, I thought like, oh, scouring is just, um, is not important. I can just skip over this. But I learned that I was really wasting a lot of my valuable, precious uh, nat dye, dye extracts. Um, what scouring does because a lot of the materials that we're working with have a um, natural like oil or residue or are sort of um, just sort of like have dust or residue on it. Um, what we really need to do with scouring is to sort of remove all of those uh, materials from your fabric so that you can get a really nice even distribution of dye on your material. Um, Again, going back to the idea of knowing what type of fiber you're working with, it really is important to know the difference between protein and cellulose fibers because the scouring process will be different. Um, what happens with scouring is you would measure your, your textile. So if, if you are working with a t-shirt, for example, you would wanna know how much that garment weighs. So that is what WF is, that means weight of fiber. So first step is weighing out your fiber. Um, and then figuring out the percentages of the um, scouring material that you'll use. So for protein fibers, in order to scour, you would use a pH neutral detergent at 15% weight of fiber. So for example, if you have 100 grams of t-shirt, uh, you would use, oh, I'm sorry, not 15, one to 5%, my vision, I'm sorry about that. One to 5% of weight of fiber. Um, for cellulose fibers, you would use Soda ash at about one to two percent weight of fiber, um, and what you would do is add that to a pot of water, um, enough water in the pot that your material or your garment can move around freely, um, and then you would stir it with whatever the scouring agent would be for upwards of thirty minutes. Um, you want to make sure that the temperature doesn't raise too high, um, because for example, things like silk. Uh, which people love because of the natural sheen, um, high temperatures can kind of um, degrade the qualities of those fabrics. So you want to make sure that you can keep a thermometer on that and make sure that you're not raising temperature too high. Um, the next step after scouring, and again, this is really, really important. Step one, scouring. I cannot emphasize that enough. I thought that I could skip over it, but don't highly recommend always scouring first step. So step number two is mordanting. Again, it's really important to know what type of fiber you're using. So you'll see that's broken up into protein fibers versus cellulose fibers. Um, if you are mordanting, and oh, sorry, what mordants are, in case you're interested in knowing, mordants are medical, or sorry, are, are metal uh, salts that help bind the dye molecules um, to the actual fiber. So Fibers won't take a lot of natural dyes very easily on their own. Like if I just took a piece of fabric, stuck it into a dye pot, um, that color may adhere, may stick, but it won't have as much light fastness. It won't have as much longevity in terms of the color quality. So the mordants are really important because it helps us keep that connection between the color and the fiber. So for protein fibers, what we would do is create a, a solution of, um, again, working off of weight of fiber, 12% alum and 6% um, cream of tartar. So what that means is if I have, again, 100 grams of some garment, um, you would want 12 grams of alum and 6 grams of cream of tartar. You would take those powders, mix them into um, a pot or a vessel of uh, hot water um, until they dissolve and put your fiber into it and move that fiber around for up to about 45 minutes for protein fibers. Um, so for example, if you want a skein of wool and you're trying to um, mordant that skein of wool, you want to make sure that 
you are constantly moving that stain of wool around uh, without tangling and creating like an insane knotted mess. Um, but you want to sort of do that in the pot for up to 45 minutes. And again, the temperature is really crucial, especially for something like wool, um, because as you pro probably know, wool tends to felt at too high of a temperature. So um, really keeping that thermometer, the thermometer on hand, keeping an eye on the temperature, um, and keeping that fiber moving on around consistently. Um, mordanting cellulose fibers is a little bit different. We're still using alum, but instead of cream of tartar, what we're using is soda ash. So the um, solution here is 15% alum plus 6% soda ash at the weighted fiber. So again, based on 100 grams of fiber, 15% uh, alum would be 15 grams, and 6% um, of soda ash would be 6 grams of soda ash. You would create a solution, again, in a large vessel of warm water. You want the water to be hot enough to dissolve all of those salts. Um, and for cellulose, I actually, um, you can, you don't have to do it over a heated pot. You can actually do just a like a room temperature um, soak. So at least an hour, or I oftentimes will let the fiber soak in that solution for um, up to 24 hours, so overnight. The longer it doesn't, it doesn't um, hurt or affect negatively if you put it in longer. Um, I noticed that the two steps of scouring and mordanting, again, they're really important. Um, the the better you scour your fiber, and the more evenly you mordant your fiber, the more evenly the color of the dye will actually adhere to the fabric. So, um, if that is something that you're after, if you're at, if you're going for a really beautiful, even color, yellow color on your your shirt, for example. Um, scouring is so crucial, and then mordanting and making sure that like the full piece of fabric is covered and evenly distributed in the mordant is really important. Um, so I want to take a break now and uh, ask any and have any questions. Take any questions if anyone has any. Um, feel free to jump in now, and I'd love to sort of just sort uh, answer anything you you might be curious about. Absolutely, thank you, Anne. Yeah. Uh, is soda ash the same thing as washing soda? I believe it is. Yeah, it's actually um, you can find it in your uh, laundry aisle, um, and it's very, very, very inexpensive. It's um, somewhat related to baking soda, and I believe there's like some method of creating soda ash from baking soda even. I'm not a chemist, but I believe there's some sort of step along the way where you can do it. But it's a really common household item, and you can find it in the laundry aisle. Could you please explain weight of fiber again and what yeah. a percentage of weight of fiber would be? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so weight of fiber, for example, um, I have these napkins here. Uh, what I would do before I scour or before I mordant is I take this dry, it's important that it's dry, dry napkin. This is cotton. Um, I have my baking scale, my kitchen, kitchen scale, um, digital kitchen scale, and it's set to grams. And I would just take this napkin, put it on the scale, it comes out to 32 grams. Um, so I would make that calculation, for example, if we're talking about, because this is cellulose fiber, we're saying 15% um, of 32. I, I hope you aren't making me do math right now, but I, I would calculate it. I would calculate it based on that weight of fiber. So at 32 grams of fiber, I would do 15% of 32 grams for the alum, and then I believe it's 8% of the um, soda ash, so 0 0.08 times 32. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me, and I think we can go. We can make sure we'll share those those percentages with all of you sure. all at the end of the program. Yeah. Um, okay. There are different kinds of alum out there. Does aluminum ammonium sulfate, aka pickling salt, work? So I don't believe it's pickling salts. This one is aluminum potassium sulfate. There are many different types of alum, and I think that these are two separate ones, um, but it just is shortened to alum. Um, it is really common and you can also, you can, I think, find it in your baking aisle. Oh, actually, it, maybe it's pickling. I, I've never heard of it referred to as that, 
but actually now that I'm talking about it, because it is it is in the baking aisle, but but whatever it is, it is aluminum, potassium, sulfate. So if that is the same as pickling, then yes, but I didn't think it was, sorry. <laughs> And if you are mordanting a lot of fabric or scouring, let's go ahead and ask this for both. If you're scouring or mordanting a lot of fabric, can you use the washing machine? And what kind of cycle would you be using it on? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, because yeah, it would take a very massive pot to sort of scour and mordant large panels. And so I will oftentimes use the washing machine just as like a little, a little, a little cheat, I would say. Um, I would typically put it on hot. I still use the soda ash, um, and I would, depending on how thick the fabric is, if it's like a canvas, I would probably run that a couple of times, unfortunately, because, but because a thicker material just, um, just has a lot more residue in it. So you kind of need to run it, uh, more and the, um, the thinner the material, I think I would just maybe do like one wash on um on hot in terms of mordanting i've never mordanted in the washing machine i don't know how that would how that would work because with mordanting it needs to have like a an even sort of free flowing um needs to move around the pot so i would i have used like large traveling bins or you know large storage bins and i will put my material in that and um fill those those big plastic tubs with with the mordant solution. So that's one way that I that I work with large panels. The, oh, let me show the mordants. Or sorry, the the um yeah, specifically the alum. Whoever asked that question about the alum, you can see it's sort of a thicker white grain. And as I'm pouring it, maybe you can see it sort of has like these bigger So I'm glad we were to talk about scouring and warranting. Again, really important steps. The next thing I want to talk about is the different materials and tools that you need to create different surfaces and different um, designs on your fabric. So I really love being able to just use items around the house um, and just kind of finding things that, um, you know, you might for example, mason jar lids or random string or rubber bands. Um, you don't need to have anything fancy to make different uh, designs and patterns on your material. And I think it's really important to know that like being resourceful, being creative can really help you come up with really awesome designs at the end of the day. So one of my favorite things, for example, to make patterns with are clothespins. And clothespins, Shockingly, every single time, I think create beautiful, beautiful um, uh, patterns on your material, and I love using clothespins. Um, some other things that I think are really fun to work with: rubber bands or hair ties. I couldn't find hair ties, so a friend gave me a bunch of. Uh, I couldn't find rubber bands, so a friend gave me hair ties. So I think that those are um, pretty common, and you can use that to create different uh, designs and patterns. Um, popsicle sticks as a way of creating resists on fiber and after this we'll sort of talk through um, how we actually execute patterns with these things but I just sort of want to show you the different objects. So popsicle sticks are a really fun, easy, inexpensive way to create different and really beautiful patterns. Um, just any string that you have laying around. I'm a knitter and I have tons and tons and tons of yarn all the time um, and also just like so many random scrap pieces that I can use and trying to play with those to create different patterns. Um, another thing though is uh, that is really awesome is using things like pipes. So I'm going to show you one method where you can use, this is just plastic plumbing pipes and we can use this along with string to create a really beautiful, um, gorgeous pattern on material. Because I do a lot of this at home, I um, have uh, had these custom blocks made. And you can see they're super covered in indigo. They're really deep blue. Um, but I have these gorgeous blocks in different shapes. These are little small circles, um, about three inch circles, uh, some different hexagons. 
And these blocks are really fun to use to create like clean, crisp shapes on your material. Uh, what, and I'll walk through how these work as well. Um, but these are just some different objects and materials that you can use to create patterns. And um, I'm excited to show you how we can do this. So I think what we can do now is start with maybe walking through one method. And I'll start with the simplest one. I'm going to switch over to my other camera so you can see what I'm doing. So, uh, again, my favorite tools to use are simply just clothespins. Um, what you will do is take, for example, a square piece of fabric. And I always love to start. One of the easiest things is I'm just in a bind and don't know what to do in terms of a design. I'll just start with an accordion fold. Um, making a really simple fan shape with your fabric. So you can already see I have like the grid lines in terms of what path, um, but I'll just start and fold this like a fan, zigzagging it. You have to sort of fold it over and back onto itself. I'm um, not one for precision, but I really think that that can create some really beautiful, <laughs> beautiful um, surprises at the end. So this is now, you can see sort of like a zigzag as I fold it back on itself. I think some people like to see that a couple of times, so I'll try it again. Um, so you would lay your fabric out, fold it over, back under itself and just continue with that zigzag. I'm working with this dry and I will mix it up a little bit because I think that when your fabric is dry, this part of it, the folding is a lot easier. Um, however, sometimes when you put this into a dye pot, um, the fabric, because it hasn't been wetted out, and it takes the dye in a little bit of a different, it doesn't take it as well. So um, one thing that you might want to do after you fold and do your patterns is actually wet the fabric before it goes in the dye pot. Um, but yeah, it's really nice to work with it dry because it's a little bit easier to fold and maneuver. All right, so I have my zigzag again, just the accordion, the fan fold. And I'm going to just take my clothespins and it's really simple, just running along the edge of it. And creating just a long line of closed pins on the side. And I like doing it on both sides just to sort of play with it and see how that might turn out. The thing about when you're folding fabrics like this and then clipping them with um, closed pins is now you'll see like there's this sort of pocket in the center, right? Um, what you want to make sure is that because now we sort of created this pocket, you want to keep it in the die pot a little bit longer because the dye needs to penetrate and make sure that it goes through all of the layers. So um, you want to just be aware of, like it doesn't seem like it's that they've made too thick of a, of a package, but it is somewhat challenging for dye to penetrate through all of it. So you want to make sure that it stays in the dye pot for a little bit longer. So this is method one. I really love this. And I'm, we'll do the reveal at the end of it so you can kind of see what pattern this makes. Um, but close in, number one, awesome technique. I'm excited to show you what that looks like. So that's the first. The second one, I mentioned the tubing, the like plumbing tubing. This is just cut down into about 18 inches just over a foot so that it can fit into my dye pot. So you can see like 
if I have fabric down here, it'll actually fully submerge um, and I can still reach the top. So what I'm going to do with this is take a piece of silk fabric and I, I think silk works really nicely because it's a thinner material. Like, well, the type of silk I'm using is a little bit thinner. Um, this is inspired by a, te a Japanese technique called arashi, um, where fabric is wrapped around a pole and then tied with a string, um, creating these really beautiful waveforms across the piece. Um, there's a lot of different ways that traditionally the fabric is attached to the pole and tied, um, but the, the way that I'm going to do it, and I don't know if this is a traditional way, but I think it's an easy way at home to do it, is you take your fabric, it's laid out like this, um, I can take the pole, put it at the center of my piece of art fabric, sort of pick up each corner. So now I just have fabric around the pole. And then I'm going to take um, string and starting at the end of the pole, just start wrapping this string really tightly around so you can see. And what I'm doing is wherever the string is touching the fabric, the dye will not touch that. So it's going to create white lines. So this is like resist, this is creating a resistance support on the fabric. And you can see as I'm doing it, I can like sort of um, twist the fabric to create even more layers of texture and pattern. And I'm just gonna keep wrapping it. Until you've created this like really tight bundle, you can see. So anywhere that the string has touched, that's going to um, be a resist and create a white, a white area on the fabric. At the end, I'm just going to sort of tie it off or tuck it in. And then another thing that you can do to see if you can create even more, more of a texture is sort of push the fabric down towards the end. So you can see I've sort of consolidated and sort of pushed it all the way down so that I can create even more, more texture there. So that's method two, inspired by Arashi, which is a shibori, Japanese shibori technique. Um, a third technique is, I mentioned these custom boards that I have. Um, I have two of each. And you need two of each because um, the fabric is essentially sandwiched between these boards, um, clamped on, and then um, put into the dye sack. So you need to make sure you have doubles of everything. These are really cool. I think they're made out of Brazil wood, Brazil wood. So they are fairly water, like they haven't worked. I've used these for about a year now and they have still maintained their shape. I've used and had custom boards made from like a less expensive plywood, but those tend to really degrade over time. It doesn't, like, it just warps and doesn't maintain its nice straight quality, which makes it a little bit challenging for, for the, um, the, the pattern, pattern making. Um, so I really think that if you are interested in this method, investing in a nicer type of wood for these shapes is important so that you could kind of like hold on to them for a lot longer. Um, this is a clamping method that is based on the Pitsujime, which is another shibori um, Japanese traditional uh, method of pattern making. So I'm going to work with these circles. I really love circles. They're super simple and can create really beautiful um, designs. Again, with my square piece of fabric, Again, I'm going to start with that method of doing an accordion fold. Because my circle is a little bit bigger, and I want it to kind of live in a space, and I want to be able to see the circle, I'm going to make 
my accordion a little bit bigger. So I'm going to just make this a four, a four panel fan or accordion. So you can see really simple. Um, and then what I'm going to do here is now fold it and into accordion in the reverse, so into squares. I'm going to just match it there, the center, fold it back onto itself. And so now you can see I have this zigzag, you can tell, of how I folded it into roughly a, a square that's big enough to hold the circle. So I'm going to put the circle board here. You can see it's sandwiched. Um, and when you take these C clamps, and it's really important in this part of this process to clamp it really, 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 really tight. And because this is a slightly larger board, I think I'm going to use two C clamps, one on each side, to create even, um, to sort of create even pressure on both sides of the boards. And you can see these are covered in indigo because I use these a ton. But yeah, you'll you'll think that you're having it, that you're squeezing it tight enough, but you really, really, really want to go even tighter to create a nice clean resist on that. So this is the third method, the fourth. So I have that, the um, Tajime clamps and boards, the Arashi with the pole and the string. And then I also have the method of just using household objects, which are closing. Does anyone have any questions? And we can kind of start Stop there before we move on. Yes, so since you were just repeating yeah. the names of the Shibori methods, could you yes. say those slowly one more time? We're getting questions about how you spell that. So I don't know if you know the spelling off the top of your head. If you do, that's great. If not, I think a slow repeat um, would be great. Arashi, which is the poll method, this one, is A-R-A-S-H-I. A-R-A. S H I. Um, and again, this is just inspired by it. This is by no means like it's a very technical, really precise process that I, I think traditionally that, that is um, that accomplishes this uh, pattern. Um, but this is just like a nice, easy, fun way to do it at home. If you don't have a pole, like a plastic pole like this, I'm sure you can find other objects. I think you can use like a wine bottle, for example, or even a taller jar. Um, so anything cylindrical uh, that, you know, I, I love the idea of using like any old glass bottle um, instead of having to go out and buy, you know, a plastic piping. Um, but yeah, so just sort of think about ways that you can um, reinterpret like this cylindrical whole shape. So Arashi. This with the clamps and the boards is Itajime. So I T A. J I M E, Itajime. Um, and that is with the boards and clamps. Uh, and that's another method of creating resist. Oh, and I think if you aren't able to create custom boards, again, another thing that you can do is maybe Tupperware lids or mason jar lids, you know, in the way that mason jars have these like pop out things. I know that my house has tons of these just laying around, and I've used these before to create resist. So, trying to be resourceful with the things that you have, or if you have old plastic, you know, notebook, fold, like notebook covers or plastic folders, you can actually even cut out um, whatever shapes you like uh, to create custom forms. So it doesn't have to be, you don't have to go fancy. You don't have to like buy Brazil wood and have these custom boards cut out. You can just try and find um, materials around the house that you can retrofit. I love it. There are all levels of ways to get involved but Definitely, yeah. really great question on that point are there materials that you should avoid when you're creating resist um uh, that is a good question um 
I don't know. I don't think so. I well, I mean, in terms of, I guess I would need to know is the question in terms of like things you don't want to put in your dye pot, or is it more in terms of like what shapes that you want to create? Because I think if it's in terms of like pattern making and circuit design, I think just go for it. Go for anything. I think another method that you can even do that is really exciting is, for example, taking rocks. And this is another traditional method where you would take rocks and put them into your fabric. And you can take string or rubber bands. Like I would do this, like if this were a rock, take rubber bands and string and just tie your fabric around like this. So no, I don't think there's anything that you need to avoid um, unless we're talking about like toxicity and like things that shouldn't go into a, a heated pot. But in terms of surface design, um, I think you can play with it and really just use whatever you have laying around. So yeah, I love that like I can go out into my garden, grab some pebbles and create these little, you know, shapes like this, tying them on the piece and just seeing what comes from it. So I think just sort of exploring, opening your eyes to what's around in, in your house and um, just having fun with it. Great. Do you ever use binder clips for resist? Uh, yes, I have used binder clips, and I don't think that because the sur like the 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 surface where the binder clips, you know, connect or touch clamp is a little bit narrower. Um, it is really fun to use. I just don't like it as much as the clothespins because the clothespins have like that actual square part that um, touches. Um, but definitely use binder clips and try it out. The one thing that I would be uh, cautious of, tying back to what the other person asked about things to avoid. Um, you do have to re remember that this is going to go into a dye pot and that is a bath of liquid. And if you kind of forget about certain things, um, which I oftentimes do, things can get <laughs> rusty and kind of grow. So things like binder clips, which have a lot of metal, like might kind of get a little bit rusty if you don't take care of it or keep an eye on it. But that's just me and I'm kind of just sort of throwing in a pot and coming back like days later. But if you're on top of it, I think anything is possible. So. For those supplies you've used previously in indigo, especially like the blocks, do you are there any concerns about that bleeding into other color dye baths? Yeah, um, so yes. <laughs> I think that indigo can bleed in it's you can see it's like coming off onto my hands already. Um, but you know, I've I've used them over and over again and sometimes it'll leave a residue of indigo. Um, but I personally love sort of like those touches that happen accidentally and so I've never minded it but yeah you should if you're if you're really worried about mixing colors um, perhaps have separate separate boards and separate um, materials but um, I just like being able to mix and match and if, if some indigo gets onto my other garments I'm, I'm never displeased I guess but yeah you do have to kind of be aware of that if you're worried about that and you named a few shibori methods. Do those work well with types of dye baths that aren't indigo, avocado, yeah, so turmeric, actually, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think like you'll traditionally see them, I mean, you'll oftentimes see them with indigo, but really you can use them with any dye pot. So the dye bath I have here today is actually um, a matter extract. And so we'll get to see it with this pinkish red color. Um, you can feel free to use any of these techniques with whatever dye bath that you'd like. You know, you can even do um, some in matter or, or turmeric or marigold and then also dip into indigo. So you can kind of create these really cool layers of color and texture and pattern. So like, don't feel, don't feel um, stuck in one color or one method. Uh, you can just sort of like overlap and layer and create really cool things. Great, thank you. Yeah. So um, if that's all the questions for this session I, or this round, I can go and uh, open up some of these samples that I previously put in the dye pot. I will share. Okay, so earlier I did put a few samples into this matter pot. Can you all see the matter pot? We can see the edge of it. I think yeah. we're, yeah, we, we can see it. This is my matter pot. And you can see the pole. Earlier I was talking about how it's tall enough that it can kind of lean outside of the pot. And that's really nice just in terms of handling it. But this was the Arashi method that you can see with the string. 
They also have floating around in here the um, method with the closed pins. So it kind of lets these let these kind of drip drip off for a second before I open them up. But let me start with the closed pins. So, no, here, let me do It's nice to make a bowl that you can kind of open everything up and do. But yeah, you can see earlier, it's a little bit different than what I did in the sample. So for the sample, um, I did it on both sides. But for the one earlier, I only did a one edge to kind of see what that would look like. So I'm gonna open it up, you can see, you can see the small squares I was talking about. So, so first you asked about binder clips. The binder clips would be probably really beautiful, but they would probably create more lines as opposed to these small squares. Um, and you can do the matter, I use matter extract, which creates a much deeper red um, than using like a matter root down down. But yeah, the color turned out really beautifully with this. So yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to stick with indigo. You can do whatever color you like. And again, like you can see some of these have been used in indigo before, but um, there may be some area of like that where you see like a tad bit of dark edge. So, you know, to the person who asked about that as well, that might be something to consider. So I'm opening it up, it's my favorite part, but yeah, these are closed pins. And it created this gorgeous, pattern of squares, of small squares. And that was just by doing an accordion fold um, with closed pins on one side. So this one, because it's on both sides of the fabric, would probably create even more lines of pattern. Um, but even doing it along one edge created like a really beautiful consistent grid. So I love closed pins so much, and I think this is like a really Great example, and it turned out really beautifully. Um, one thing that you should notice is again, I talked earlier about you know, as you're accordion folding the fabric, it'll create pockets, right? Um, and those pockets you can see where the color is a little bit lighter here, where it's faint. That's the inner folds of the, the fabric where the dye didn't fully penetrate. This obviously was on the outside edge and received a lot of that dye really, really well. So the color should be. So if that's something that you're concerned about, um, that's just something to note. It's time in the dye bath, but also sort of the way that you fold and create your patterns. But I think that those variations really make it beautiful. So closed pins, this is uh, option one, or you know, version one. The next one is the Arongi. So I use silk. Ooh, um, I forgot to pull. So there's liquid in there. I am going to just unwrap. And you can see where I pulled the string off, where it's created like these gorgeous lines of white. I'm excited to show you when it opens up. Okay, so that's. Oh, it's so pretty. So it created this spider web effect almost. And you can see this is the center is where it fell over top of the end of the pole, and all of these lines are what were created from the string. So it looks, I believe it means like waves or storm, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, it just has that like the waves effect, um, and it's really gorgeous how it just like runs in this radial pattern from the center. So that was the um, Arashi method with the pole and string. Um, the last one 
with um, circular boards and for this this example I actually did something different where I folded the fabric into triangles so I started with the accordion folds but then I kind of like making a paper football I folded it into a small triangle um, and there's a board on each side sandwiched a corner in so you can see I put just a corner of the fabric into in between the boards and what that creates are these really cute little like floral patterns. And so you can kind of see if you were to like recreate this um, where the accordion fold took place. And then uh, because I folded it into a triangle and only covered one corner, it created these really cool floral shapes. So yeah, this was the Itajime. The Arashi. And then the um, close-in. Yeah. So did anyone have any questions after that? I think it was really exciting to see how they all look, um, but I would love to take the last round of questions before we wrap everything up. Yeah, so first question, how long were those things soaking in your matter dye? Um, they were only soaking in the matter dye uh, bath for about um, an hour and a half. And because it's the matter extract, the color is like very vibrant and saturated. Um, I think if you're working more with the root ground up, that would obviously take, you know, you need to soak the matter root overnight and it's a lot much longer drawn out process, but this is extract. So the color was very rich um, and immediate. Can you talk a little bit about what your next steps will be with this fabric? And I do want to share the specific questions about this that we got so that we can make sure you answer them. Um, so how do you wash these fabrics after you unwrap them? And will the dye run into the lighter or white areas when the fabric is rinsed? That's a really good question. So all of these materials, materials were mordanted, first of all. Um, to the question about will they bleed into the white parts? Um, sometimes that will happen. Um, I think what the immediate first step is taking these pieces, putting them into um, into the sink or a hot wash, and just rinsing out uh, the rinsing it out um, with hot water until the water runs clear. Uh, so you would do that if you're worried about it bleeding into the white parts. Um, sometimes what people will do is just wash before you unclamp or before you take everything off and try and get some of that excess dye off beforehand um, for really like clean, crisp uh, prints. Um, after you do the hot wash you know, by hand, uh, I would probably put these into my washing machine as well. And then you can use a little bit of pH neutral detergent, um, just a tiny bit and do like another, another machine wash with that. Um, I think there are other methods of trying to create like there are methods of trying to keep the color light bath um, quality. So I know that some dyers will sometimes put their garments post dye into like a soy bath. And I think that can help with some of those um, light fast qualities. But I usually just do the wash until it's run until it runs clear. Great. So we have a few questions to sort of play catch up from other sections of today's demo. Do you use the same pot for mordanting and dyeing? So I do not. I and I typically two two reasons why. First, I typically do the overnight bath at room temperature. 
Um, and so I really like how easy that is. I can just scour and then stick all of my materials into um, a bowl or a tub, a vessel, bucket, whatever, and let that just soak overnight. And so it's a really like easy, you know, just sort of at the back of my mind process of mordanting. Um, I don't have to put on a burner. I don't need to like keep it warm. So I, I like that. Um, secondly, I don't think I personally would want to mordant and dye in the same pot because I think that is where you kind of get the residual color and, um, you know, it kind of can potentially like bleed onto your garments. I do though know tons of dyers that do that and I don't think it ever like cross contaminates. So I think I'm just being a little bit more particular. Um, but if you're doing this at home and you only have one pot, I'd say go for it. Don't, just use the one pot. Um, and give it like a good wash in between. But just because I have the space and I'm able to, I separate those two steps. Sure, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about sourcing materials? Like what kind of location can you buy this stuff from? Yeah, of course. There's a lot of really awesome vendors online um, that are uh, really like really thoughtful with the way they get their dye materials. Um, and just amazing resources for um, the process. So like in terms of how you even scour, how you mourn, how you dye, a lot of these places online are um, super great. So I would recommend um, a few places. Uh, I would say one is um, Maiwa. It's a Canadian-based brand. Another is Botanical Colors. Kathy Hattori runs Botanical Colors amazing person, so knowledgeable, amazing blog, resources, go to their site. Um, also, Earth Hues is another, um, and I think one that's really common is Dharma Trading. So there's a number of places where you can get these materials, um, and I, I think any of them would be really great sources. Do you have a favorite book with references to natural dye that you'd like to recommend? I do. It's actually right here, so I, I'm glad someone asked. Uh, this book is the ultimate, it's the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate guide to natural dyeing. It was um, written by Joy Boutrop and Catherine Ellis. It is called The Art and Science of Natural Dyes. It is the text, ultimate textbook on the dye process, on the science, the chemistry behind it. It has recipes, it has um, every, everything you could possibly need. Um, and I really love how thoughtful it is and how much it goes into the chemistry and science of it. Um, you gain so much from this. And I would say anyone who's interested in pursuing this in um, a, a deeper fashion, like highly recommend that book. Great. Well, thank you so much, Anne. Yeah. So thank you all to the audience for joining us today. And thank you, Anne, for this fantastic presentation.